Well, good evening, church. You look fabulous, really, you do. You look fantastic. Hey, we like to be an encouraging group here at First Christian. Would you do me a favor? Would you turn to the person to your left and to your right and say, you look good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. We, if, if you did that to a total stranger, you get bonus points for that. <laughs> if that stranger is asking for your phone number after the service, um, just tell them you don't look that good. We like to stay <laughs> humble here too, so it's all right. Hey, I want to uh, uh, thank you for coming out. To worship together like this um, is a great expression of God's love in and through us, and it's a joy uh, to be here with you tonight. I want to read uh, a, a scripture passage, one that might seem like it fits for a Christmas Eve service, maybe one that doesn't. Um, I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, which tells us about the Magi or the wise men, um, but then also just one verse from John chapter 14, verse 6. So this is God's word. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet was, has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And then John 14:6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Would you just pray with me just for a moment? Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to move among us tonight. We thank you, Father, for the joy of being able to be in your presence, not by anything we deserve, all by your grace, but by your grace also, Lord, would you speak to us tonight through your word, that we would find real joy, meaning, and purpose in this celebration of the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ. Be with us now, Lord, as we look into your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking at the, the wise men or the magi might not seem like too big of a stretch for a Christmas Eve service, but um, it's interesting. There's a lot of trivia uh, connected to the magi, to the wise men, or as uh, third grade theologians call them, the wise guys, um, these men. Um, we don't know exactly how many, even though we often sing about or talk about how many they, most people think, well, there's three, they say. Well, as you read with me, it doesn't actually say how many wise men there were. Uh, we also, a pardon your crash scene at home, it's very unlikely that the wise men were there at the actual birth of Jesus like the shepherds were. Our text here tells us that they come to a house, not to the manger scene. So this is sometime later. We think Jesus may have been even up to two years old by the time that the wise men see them. Also, how wise they were, we're not sure. 
Um, <laughs> the idea behind uh, the uh, classification of, as wise men, it's actually, they're, they're kind of this weird combination. They, they could have worked for NASA, and they could have also been the guys who write the fortunes in your fortune cookies, because they were both astronomers and astrologers. And in this first century period of time, they were seen as the ones who had wisdom. We don't know where they got their gifts, if they were uh, wealthy themselves or if they had to sacrifice in some way to have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, if they didn't use their 40% off coupon at Hobby Lobby, they weren't really wise. But at any rate, we have these men, and we recognize they're connected to the birth narrative. They're connected to Jesus' birth in some way here, whether it was sometime after or not. But the, one things, the two things that we really do know that is really the most crucial thing, most important thing, we know that they worship Jesus. And we know that they worship Jesus when Jesus was a child, which tells us that they had faith, faith and worship. They worshiped Jesus before Jesus grew up and taught. They worshiped Jesus before Jesus was old enough to do miracles, before Jesus died on the cross, before Jesus rose from the dead. They had faith in seeing in a child this was no ordinary child. They had faith and they worshiped. So many times when we go to a text like this, we say, well, you see that phrase every once in a while that says, wise men still seek him. That's true, but I think it puts the emphasis on the wrong spot. It puts the emphasis on us as if, if we're wise enough, if we're smart enough, if we're spiritual enough, we can somehow get to God. We'll be able to figure God out. And this text, like every other text in the Bible, is so consistent about the gospel. And the gospel is never about what we do to try to reach God. It's always, first and foremost, what God has done to reach us. See, because the truth is, even though these wise men go seeking for Jesus, God was looking and seeking for them long before they ever began to seek for him. And this is true not only back then, but it's true for us today. I want to look at how these men exhibit the truth of the gospel in this statement that Jesus gives us, definitive statement. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which is this weird paradox. It means that even in coming to Jesus, God is active to bring them to Jesus. They have to come to Jesus through Jesus. Here's how it works out, I think. We begin, how do they even know? This is on the horizon, verse 2. Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him, which tells me this, that God uses wonder to move us to Jesus as the way. He does it for the Magi by giving them this sign. These were guys who studied the stars. They studied the heavens regularly. But this one time, they saw something so unusual that it struck them to the point where they said, there's something else happening here. And by the way, these guys are what we would call spiritual outsiders. They're not Jews. They aren't a part of what we would call the promised people, the promised land, anything like that. They're far removed from that, which is really good. If you are here tonight, I know sometimes people make jokes about this. Folks who might be only here, if you're one of this, this group who's here on Christmas or Easter, can I just tell you, we are glad that you're here. We are thrilled that you're here. And I just want to encourage you with something. If you feel a little uncomfortable in a church setting, you're not sure when they're standing, when they're sitting, you're not sure what to quite do when we're praying, I just want you to know you're in good company because these guys understood that. They are the spiritual outsiders. And if God is taking great pains and efforts to reach those who are outside, it tells you very clearly you don't have to worry about being so far outside that you're left out. Even if you have not given God much thought in your life, even to this point tonight, God has been thinking about you. Oh, you have been on his heart. Don't ever forget that. God is actually going to great lengths to get your attention. In fact, maybe tonight, but he's done it with the Magi, with the wise men, by actually creating this event in the starry heavens. We know back at this time, this has been studied and there's been books and written uh, about this uh, many times over. We know there was this kind of weird conjunction around that time between Jupiter and Saturn. We know that there was something happening in the sky. 
These astrologers went cra crazy over this event. It's actually written about in other sources as well. They all looked at it. And at the very same time, in this same time period, there is this rumor that is going around the Mediterranean area, around the Middle East, and around an area so wide and vast that it was recorded by multiple historians, Tacitus and Suetonius and Josephus, and even a Roman general. There's this rumor that there was going to rise out of Judah, out of Judea, a great ruler. And there came later a Roman general, um, his name was Vespasian, and he actually in 70 AD conquered an uprising in Jerusalem and wiped out Jerusalem. And when he went back to Rome, this rumor was so strong that he actually used that as part of his campaign to become emperor. He said, hey, I'm, I'm that, you know, that rumor that there's going to be this strong ruler out of Judea. That's me. I conquered Jerusalem. That's me. These wise men, knowing that this rumor is circulating and then seeing this star, begin to say, maybe there's more to this than just this awe and wonder of something that we're observing. There's something special going on here. Maybe so special that it's a king that deserves to be worshipped. The interesting thing is when they show up and they talk to King Herod, they don't plan on worshipping Herod. There's no indication that they bow down and worship just any king. They say there's something special happening here. God has gotten our attention with a sense of awe and wonder. Do you know what it's like to be in wonder? I think you do. You may not think it's very spiritual, but I want to tell you, when you experience this kind of sense of awe and wonder, just as simple as when you look out at the western sky and you see in the Kansas sunset colors that are painted that Crayola would never think of that are just amazing across the sky, and just for that moment in your busyness, you pause and you just take it in and that sense of wonder, the sense of wonder that some of you are going to experience tonight after we're done here where you're going to have uh, just tremendous food, some of your favorites maybe. And when that food hits your tongue and it dances on your tongue and it's so good that we often what? We actually close our eyes when we're tasting it. Because it's great, it tastes wonderful, but there's a sense of wonder at how good something could be. The wonder of having a good friend or a spouse, maybe the person sitting next to you tonight, who knows you at your worst, and they still want to sit next to you. That's a wonder. The wonder of sitting out on the lake in the middle of a summer night, and you're fishing in a boat, and that sense of peace and calm is so thick, it's almost like hanging in the air, and you don't even care if you catch fish because a sense of wondrous peace is on you. The sense of wonder when you watch your favorite athletes, and they have this great combination of poise and strength and they've brought these together to show this mastery of some skill that we just wonder what it would be like to be like that. But to watch them gives this rise in you of, yes, wonder and awe or music. How, can, how is it that certain songs, just the combination of the way the tune is and certain lyrics and instrumentation brings you and me to tears? How can music bring that up in us? It's a sense of wonder holding your grandchild, sorry, first-time grandfather, <laughs> and looking in your grandchild's face, and you see, amazingly, something of your son or your daughter in that face, and something of you in both of them, and you know, I'm forever connected. There's a sense of wonder and awe, maybe wonder even in worship. I don't mean the wonder that says, I wonder how long this preacher's going to keep talking. <laughs> you know that sense of wonder when you're sitting in a worship service and you're saying, hey, God is here. And not just here, but it seems like he actually is speaking to me. Like God has his attention. Of all the people and places in the world, his attention is on me. 
and suddenly there's something that rises from your gut that says maybe my life really matters and there's a sense of wonder that a God so great could care about someone like me. You know, you know what wonder is, you do. I'm just telling you, when you experience that feeling, that sensation, that, that moment, you are at the same place as the Magi. They look up at the sky and they're saying, we have watched the stars every night. But there is something different here. It's almost as if there's, there's meaning to all of the randomness of the universe. Almost as if there's a purpose behind this that maybe there's a God greater than just a local deity, but a God over all. This would be a God worth worshiping. God gets their attention with wonder, but then they do the most important thing and what we could miss because you can sit on the lake and you can have that moment of wonder in all these different forms, but if we stop at the thing or the person itself who gives us the wonder, we can enjoy that moment, but we will end up worshiping created things. And instead of just saying, wasn't that great that one night we saw that star come out? Wow, that was fantastic. Remember that? Yeah, they say, no. What if we take another step? What if God took his first step towards us to give us the wonder to draw us to himself, Jesus as the way? Some of you will receive a gift card. Maybe you've already received it for Christmas. 70% of us will receive a gift card for Christmas. They'll be uh, up to a restaurant or to a, a department store or something like that. But studies show that every year, some of you have $300 worth of gift cards that have not been used in your home. In the last six years, I know retailers, uh, they love gift cards for this reason. $41 billion, with a B, billion dollars worth of gift cards were purchased and never redeemed. That is what it's like when God gives you and me a moment of wonder and we don't follow him. We don't look and ask the question, what if there's a giver of wonders? Well, what if I didn't stop and just enjoy this moment but said, who's behind this and to seek him? That's what the wise men begin to do. They are moved to follow the star, but they get it wrong at first. Here's what happens, verses 4 and 5. They come... To Jerusalem, and they ask um, Herod the king, Where is this king to be born? Herod doesn't know his scriptures, so he asks the, the teachers of the law, and they say, Well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. They get it wrong because they go with their own gut instinct of, What should I do if I'm really going to seek after this God, the giver of wonder, of all wonders in life? Well, I would go where I think. He would be, which would be Jerusalem. It's the capital of Judea. If a, a ruler is going to rise out of Judea, it's got to be in Jerusalem, right? Here, God's already taken the next step by giving Scripture, revealing Himself supernaturally through the writers of Scripture. And it's not where you think. It's actually in Bethlehem. They don't know God's Word. They don't know these Scriptures. If they do, they probably see Him as nothing more than other ancient writings that they have themselves. And Bethlehem doesn't seem to make sense. It's about five miles south of Jerusalem, a little podunk town of Bethlehem. A lot of shepherds there, but why would you want to go to Bethlehem to look for the great king who's worthy of worship? But here's the key. They let God's word take priority over what they think is right, over their gut feelings, over their own instincts, and they say, if that's where this God has revealed himself to become this king, who is born, will go to Bethlehem. And suddenly it says, this is beautiful, it says they start on their way. There's no guarantees yet, but on their way they see the star as they're on the way to Bethlehem, and it says then they are overjoyed. Suddenly, Scripture comes alive. It's not just a dusty old book anymore. Suddenly what they have heard becomes real and personal for them. And it happens the moment that someone says, what if... I quit just understanding who God is, but began to step out and obey who God says he is, what he wants me to do. If you have been moved by wonder to begin seeking God, you will never know God with clarity apart from the scriptures that testify to Jesus not only as the way, but Jesus as the truth. 
And then lastly this. When they see the star, they saw the star, they're overjoyed. And then on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Seeing the star in connection with the truth of Scripture brings them joy, but there's really one more critical step. They have to know this Savior personally. It's not enough to know that you believe in Jesus. It's not enough to know information about the correct beliefs. It's not enough until it becomes personal. And they could have stopped at that point and said, well, we know that he's there now. But instead they go and they see him and the only way you really come to know God then is through worship. They give freely, willingly, not grudgingly. But this is where many people hesitate. Jesus, the way, the truth, the life, but they fear. This is where fear stops us from really getting personal with God. This is where people tend to withdraw when they sense that God is speaking to them because they have a view of God that's not scriptural. They have a fear of this God, that God has come to be among us, but not for good. And some of you may have seen this story. It was just, it was last week, I think. CBS Evening News ran this. Many of you know the Secret Santa um, in Kansas City. It's been around for a long time, but I know that has spawned many other Secret Santas. But they ran this great story that showed a Secret Santa in Kansas City who did it a little bit differently this year. Wealthy businessman who anonymously wanted to give out about $100,000, $100 bills at a time, randomly to people. And normally he would just get individuals to do this, but this year he wanted to get the police to do it. And so what he did was he went to the sheriff's department and he gave these officers many, many hundreds of dollars of bills and he said, I want you to stop people and give them $100. Well, you know what the reaction, they had the camera crew there. You see those lights in the back of your, you know, as you're looking in the back, how many of you say, oh, glad tidings of great joy because behind me, no, it's not happening. We're saying, oh, there's an authority, there's a power present, but it's not for my good. And it was just amazing to watch as, as these officers, and they pulled them over randomly, but they did it in this way. They said they looked for vehicles that were banged up, that had broken windshields or parts missing, and they looked to see these are my people who could really, really use some of this money that comes out of nowhere. And so as they pulled people over, the first reaction that people had was, oh, I, I didn't do anything wrong. What, why'd you pull me over? One lady especially, they had this, they showed she was on her cell phone, probably a no-no right there, and you get pulled over. She's on her cell phone, and she's saying to us, some friend, some family member, she says, I just got pulled over, and I didn't do anything wrong. I've got to hang up now. And she hangs up, and the officer is standing there at her door. And he says, ma'am, do you know why I pulled you over? And he says, are, are you doing okay tonight? And she said, well, I was until you pulled me over. He says, well, from Secret Santa, I'd like you to have this. And this is amazing transformation from fear and anger. She immediately just broke down. She was overwhelmed by the fact that I thought to be in the presence of this power, this authority, only could be for my bad. And it was for my very good, for my best. That's how it is with God. So many people are afraid to come this personally close to this God who has come to be the way, the truth, and the life because they think, He knows the worst of me. There's no way that this is good news if you really knew the depths of my sin, of my heart, of my darkness. Isn't this what we proclaim tonight? This is the good news. God with us, and He is for you. Yes, we have sin that has to be dealt with, but the good news is he's come to do that too. And he says, oh, you fear my presence. Enter my presence by grace, and you'll never be the same. By the way, this is just the beginning for the Magi. Some people think that was the end of it. They go, they see the baby Jesus, and I guess that's the end of the story for them. But you get a hint of this because on their way out, there's this kind of beautiful phrase that says here, that they returned to their country by another route. 
that's not just geography, folks. That's actually saying there's also a difference in them. There's a change in their life. Because now when they go, God is speaking to them in a dream. And he says in the dream, don't go back to Herod. And they listen and they obey. See, now we're in relationship. Now it's every day with Jesus, not just on special days, every day where we're listening for his voice and taking steps of obedience. And it's all because he does something first. Not that we reach for God, but God has already come to us. That's why we celebrate tonight. God with us in Jesus Christ. We remember the Magi. We see how they respond to Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. God loves us first. He reaches out first. He seeks us first. And the only question is, how will you respond? Don't let one more Christmas go by where you know all about Jesus but haven't taken that personal step to know Jesus. He has come to give you abundant life.